Well, I'm not supposed to be able to find it right now. Seven. We better check in with Shady. Shady, what's yeah. going on? I'm just listening, trying to figure out. Um, oh, we're, what we're still on the. Talking about. We're, we're we're distracted on the chit chat, and I actually wanted to have you tell us a little bit more about what you were texting me about. Oh. Um, should I send a link? John, if I send a link to you, would you be able to do something with it? Yeah. You can do something with it. <laughs> um, should I send I can... it in the chat? Yeah, yeah, send it. Okay, let me, let me get to it real quick. Um, Barb asked me today how I was doing with that, Bobby, and I was like, you know, I'm just haven't really think I'm not really thinking about it because I feel myself getting into a because she was saying uh, this particular situation is sort of like maybe her having to kind of relearn or not relearn. I don't know, Barb, you're on thinking about yeah. it in a different way or whatever. Yeah, having to reevaluate something she knew before, I thought she knew before, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I can't. Okay, so I can't share. I don't have like an actual link because it's in an app, but it's a it's a children's storybook from the Jehovah Witnesses, and I haven't thought about it ever since. Just what was that yesterday? Barb and I were going over Genesis six four. Mm -hmm. what's the name and, of the book maybe i can find it online um it's called um it's just called bible stories in the jehovah witness library okay i'll see if and I can then find it. the chapter i am specifically referencing is I think it's chapter eight. My book of Bible stories. And it's chapter eight, Giants in the Earth. Okay. Yep, I'm there. So, um, long story short, well, it's not really a long story, but uh, <laughs> I think the main thing is that they are saying um, the Bible says that, okay, they're talking about the bad angel. Satan was busy making trouble. He was even trying to get God's angels to be bad in time. Some of these angels started to listen to Satan. They stopped the work that God had for them to do in heaven. And they came down to earth and made human bodies for themselves. Do you know why? The Bible says that it is because these sons of God saw the pretty women on earth and wanted to live with them. <laughs> so they came to earth and married these women. The Bible says that this was wrong because God made the angels to live in heaven. When the angels and their wives had babies, these babies were different. At first, they may not have looked very different, but they kept growing bigger and bigger and getting stronger and stronger until they became giants. Wow. There's so a they, lot of <laughs> stuff they added to, I mean, literally that's all based on one verse in scripture. It's, yeah. <laughs> they reference Genesis six, one through eight and Jude six. So, so Barb and I dug into it and we looked at, I think three different versions. Then we looked in Ellen White. Then we even went to pocket sword to look <laughs> at Genesis one through <laughs> eight and Jude six. <laughs> But I remember, I wouldn't have been able to just sit here and say, oh, I remember they said giants were created from angels. It just, it came up in a weird memory bank when we read that scripture. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that, I mean, the first thing they do right off the bat is they assume that the word sons of God means angels from heaven. 
Let's see what the Hebrew says. Well, so here, here's what's interesting about taking those two verses together. They're meaning the one from Genesis and the one from Jude. Because Genesis says the sons of God saw the daughters of men. So if that were angels, then in the story, at least properly, they would have been angels now that disobeyed God. And so they'd have to now be uh, evil angels, because if you read the Jude one, it says in angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he, God, has reserved in everlasting change and darkness for judgment for the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as examples suffering vengeance of eternal fire. So, first of all, um, it would have to be referring to that's how angels fell, or one way angels fell was they were sons of God, as in angels. Then they saw the daughters of men, and then they fell. Uh, and now they would be being held for uh, eternal death or damnation, according to Jude. Um, so I'm not sure what the story does about, you know, that whole picture, but that's how it would have to, if you put it together just on those two verses, you'd have to at least explain you know, have that part of the puzzle. The problem is, is usually God doesn't refer to fallen angels as the sons of God. Uh, everywhere else in the Bible where sons of God are referred to, it's referring either to the son of God as in Jesus, or it's referring to on the earth, those who believed and followed him, like Seth or Abel, Abel and having descendants. So we have to say Seth's descendants versus Cain's descendants were referred to as um, the children of men. Go ahead, John. No, no, that's that's pretty much what I think that's where the big confusion lies with that whole verse is that it's often interpreted to mean literal angels and it's really simply referring to, to men who knew God, understood him, uh, but then they fell in, I guess you could say, temptation um, with, uh, with women who were of the other side. <laughs> so G Jesus did say also, it's interesting we don't have this verse, and we're going to just try a few verses, put them together and see what we can come up with. We could then next add that Jesus said, uh, for the angels neither marry nor give in marriage. Right. They don't procreate. They don't have children. So <clears throat> what Jesus said in the New Testament would undo that idea as well. So NLT for Jude 1, 6, it says, um, God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the day of judgment. So if I were to read that alone... I would understand it that they never even made it to earth. Yeah. Good point. So if they never even made it to earth, I'm confused as to how it got turned into they did make it to earth and reproduced. <laughs> In fact, when I read Jude, it puts to me the interesting spin that catches my attention is it doesn't say verse six, the angels who did not keep their proper domain but were thrown out of heaven by God, it actually clarifies and says they left their own abode, uh, which is different than the idea we usually have of God physically hurling them out of the, the you know, city gates and uh, condemning them to life on earth. Or Yeah, and the other, the other detail is God is the one that opened up the opportunity for Lucifer to be on the earth to talk to Eve in the first place, uh, meaning at the tree in the garden. And, and as far as we know, there is no record in scripture of angels continually changing sides, like, you know, more left after the initial uh, leaving in heaven or anything. There's nothing that describes that. So I think properly we see it as 
God first had the angels deal with their, what you might call probation or their opportunity to investigate, question, learn. And when they came to a full either acceptance or rejection, then, then there was a separating of Lucifer, now Satan, and his angels, but they were given opportunity to speak to man. And of course, then at the tree, woman and man, uh, I followed Lucifer, and that's been the case ever since, except for the redeemed. So that that story pieces at least all fit together and, and don't conflict with other scriptures. Um, I it think seems in awfully the Jews, detailed. It, it seems awfully detailed for the Jehovah Witness story. Seems oh. awfully detailed for uh, like one sentence in yeah, the yeah. scriptures. That's why John said they're adding a lot of detail, a lot of information there that's not really in the Bible. I think the only thing that's saving me from feeling a any sort of I've been lied to crisis is <laughs> <laughs> when I read that particular spot in Genesis and in Patriarchs and Prophets. I already made the assumption on my own that they were talking about believers and non-believers when they said sons of God. I right. never, I, even when I read that the first time, I, angels never came to mind. Yeah, I think the definition. Shady, I think this, I think we might've even talked about this like, um, like four years ago once when we were doing an anesthetic procedure and, and I remember you saying, because I think you had started reading Genesis and you brought that up. And I think you back then had the same idea that it wasn't, you didn't say anything about angels. I don't remember that. I remember you, I thought it, I thought the discussion back then even was, you know, sons of God being believers and daughters of you just how, had, how does it, it, took, it took this long for her to remember the old story. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I feel like I feel like that came up. Not, now that I think about it, I didn't even think about that today or yesterday. But I think that came up years ago. And anyway, that just occurred to me. Well, it's good to know that I didn't believe the garbage in the first place anyway. So it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I remember at Amber's house, you guys bringing up that question. Angels? Yeah, the question about that verse about sons of God and the daughters of men. <clears throat> uh, that's what Barb is remembering is that way back when you guys first started going through Genesis, that, that was on your list of questions one of those times when I showed up at um, Amber's house that I remember. Well, we didn't we didn't discuss it in great detail, and you certainly didn't have on on your memory bank at the time the story you just read to us. Yeah. Yes, that's a little children's book. So. <laughs> well, I was you know. Thinking, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was thinking that what I texted you yesterday was that seemed like a very good opportunity for satan to be like i'm gonna turn them against the angels and think that it's the angel's fault not mine or my manipulation so, yeah well and and you know you're you use the phrase of you know i've been lied to crisis um we we will get used to going through that quite often <laughs> Um, there's so much out there that is constantly Satan is trying to either feed us new lies or keep us stuck to old lies that uh, it does start to become one of the delights is, oh, wait a minute, look at that. I found out that one's not true. <laughs> yeah, it's such a distant memory that it, I would almost group it with finding out Santa Claus isn't real. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Not that big. laughs> it's, so, it's so distant. It's not even something that i mean because there are some things where you know we could be discussing something and i distinctly remember you know hearing something different but this is not one of those this was just a oh yeah so, so there's, a, there's a there's a lady that was here last sabbath when i 
had to get off the group. Um, and she was visiting here with some other people that were telling me about these thunders. And then they came back the next night. Well, after we got through dealing with the thunders question um, of me sort of having to say, okay, guys, wait a minute, this is, this isn't good, right stuff. You got to get off this. Then we shifted to, um, to, um, I did ended up doing justice and mercy, but this lady, she's, uh, probably in her early sixties and she's kind of a new Adventist. Um, but she's been fed so far all the same, you know, uh, stuff about the Pope and, uh, all the anti-Catholic stuff. And anyway, all the 2300 days and we're the, we're the remnant and it's, really all about what day you go to church. She's been fed all that stuff. She's got it down hook, 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 line, and sinker enough that she preaches it. And she was telling me a story about how, you remember John a couple of weeks ago, he, he brought up this thing about people attacking people's Halloween or something like that, right? And so apparently at this church, this lady, um, when there was comments made about it, she really stood up and she went after, you know, uh, how you'll be worshiping the devil if you have anything to do with how <laughs> all your kids out there collecting candy, they're worshiping the devil. Anyway, so she really let them have it. Well, so then we're doing justice and mercy. And this is the part I want to tell you about. That was all background. So we're getting to this part here about who is the judge. And she quickly shared, well, yeah, that's, that's the, uh, God. And so then she thought about it, and it was kind of funny. She has, she has done a lot of studying. Uh, so she paused it a minute, and you can see her real spin real fast. And she goes, no, wait a minute. But but didn't didn't he say somewhere that the Father's not going to judge? So then I said, yeah, read John 5, 22. So she read it, and she just lit up like a firework. <laughs> She's like, oh, it does actually say that. And then we got to the next verse. John 12, where Jesus says, oh, I'm not going to judge either. And she looked up and she said, well, wait a minute. Now, the Father's not going to judge, and neither is Jesus. I mean, just boom, just like that. She just, and, and she was so excited. When we got done, I finished up with the, the uh, intercessor little skit there. And she was, she said, see, her comment was something about, man, I have never heard this stuff before. <laughs> And she's very excited. She's coming back this Sabbath, and then she's staying here for a week because she wants to uh, spend the week digging and studying. She's got to go back and, and preach on these subjects because she preaches. So. Oh, wow. Nice. So what was really cool was it was a complete demonstration of what we read in the article about the third angel's message able to do its work all by itself. Of course, if you understand that the third angel's message is knowing the character of God and righteousness by faith, right? That That's really what the, the, the all three together and even just the third angel all by itself is. And uh, so we did that third angel's message and, and just totally lit up. She's all excited. So anyway, you guys would have enjoyed watching that. For sure. Yeah, it would have been fun. Maybe she'll join us on a call sometime. Sometime, probably. Shady, Shady should be about ready to to um, be able to teach somebody all that. I think. Oh uh, no 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 no. Why not? <laughs> I uh. Sometimes I have presentation problems. Oh, that's a nice <laughs> way of putting it. <laughs> well don't don't do a presentation just yeah. just talk about it no well that's what i'm saying i i i don't have <laughs> i don't have a good bedside manner that's another way of saying it i guess <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really not good at uh i'm just not that well, so that you know that you know the story about the israelites coming out of egypt right you, uh, you read that in genesis and exodus <clears throat> Um, I haven't made it to Exodus, no. Oh, you didn't get to Exodus. Okay. Well, no. so I'm gonna tell you this one. I'm gonna tell you this one part. So they lived in in uh, Egypt there for 400. What was it? 90 years? Some some long period of time. 
And um, so then they, they all, what they did there for Pharaoh was they made bricks out of straw and mud. They were the brick making force of the, of the country and the workforce. And so when they came out, God took them across the you know, Red Sea dry land, right? Separated the waters, they go across, uh, across the Red Sea, walking on the bottom, dry land. And then uh, many other pieces of the story. And it gets time to where uh, there's God's asking Moses to have them build him a house for him to live in, in the middle of their camp called the tabernacle or the sanctuary. <coughs> and all these guys, they didn't know how to do anything except make bricks. And now God's asking them to be master craftsmen with gold and silver and acacia wood and make all these fancy um, curtains of cloth, many layers and colors and, and all this stuff. Well, how in the world did they learn how to do all that there in the wilderness? What would be they guess? plugged into the matrix and had it downloaded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they had the sanctuary before the 40 years began. So it's not like they had 40 years to study and practice and then make a sanctuary. This was all right at the beginning because they had the Ark of the Covenant, which one of, was one of the most uh, complicated, detailed pieces of artwork to make. Um, but they had that, you know, at the story when they sent the 12 spies in, they had already done uh, some battle and had the ark out front. And um, anyway, so the point is, as it says in the scripture, the Holy Spirit came upon them and made them master workers in gold, some in silver, some in cloth, some in wood. So you got nothing to worry about, she. Well, Barb and I were talking about grace today. And she was giving me an example of a, a story of somebody giving examples of grace. <laughs> and my response was, well, that first story just sounds like he's a spoiled brat. <laughs> 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 She's like, well, I think it's more about the second example was that, you know, God shows more grace. <laughs> I'm like, well, you are sure full of a lot more grace than I am because he just sounds spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I don't, I seem to not be able to present things very or uh, translate them, uh, convey them as nicely that, as you guys do. Well, no, that's what I'm saying though, is that when the Holy Spirit uh, takes over your mouth, uh, he knows how to have excellent bedside manners yeah there's been a few there's been a couple times where i've uh you know typed something out that sounds very nice oh <laughs> some some people hear it better when you're a little bit rough and um uh not so polished yep. i was gonna say um that's when you're distrusting yourself the most, that's when you're in the best position to use his power. When you are weak, then you are strong, right? That's when that's when we will more likely let him do it. Yeah. Yeah. So don't worry about that. Just keep enjoying collecting the information. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, so so tonight was going to be. Uh, any questions that you guys think you need help with on love, forgiveness, and wrath? You've been working on any of that, Barb, lately with trying to explain or talk to other people or pieces of it you want to chat about for a few minutes? We don't have to work on that subject. On um, love, forgiveness, healing, wrath? Yeah, any part of that. I'm trying to think if I've been working on it and not not that i can think of right off give me a minute to think Mm -hmm. 
So Shady, um, interesting uh, sentence in uh, Acts of the Apostles, a description of the disciples uh, all gathered together as they're waiting for the Holy Spirit, um, which is is interesting. They're waiting for the power to be able to go out and do the work. Uh, and it, it says, as the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. As they called to remembrance the words that Christ had spoken to them before his death, they understood more fully their meaning. Truths which had passed from their memory were again brought to their minds, and these they repeated to one another. Anyway, I think we all uh, all have kind of a similar feeling to what you're saying, at least at some level. And um, the real power comes in realizing exactly what you're saying is that we can't do it in our own our own power in our own strength and so we need really more than anything to practice reaching out to god um for that power and and confessing yeah our own belief in the fact that he wants to give it to us maybe <laughs> but uh I think if we keep practicing faith and trust, um, he can help to give us that, that power to, to speak the words in the right way. I feel like I'm a little selfish. Like I um, am really just focusing on my understanding. However, on the occasion when I do find myself in a discussion and I, you know, give my testimony or whatever, <laughs> I notice that I give it and then I'm like, wow, that really meant a lot to me. <laughs> wow, that really meant a lot to me. I'm sure it sounded good to you, but <laughs> that was really good reinforcement for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I got to tell you, I started learning so much more when I, had to help other people to understand it right <laughs> even yeah. though it was just you know the job of being a sabbath school teacher at the church it was um you know now i i suddenly had the care of other people or you could say the burden of 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 you know helping other people to understand it that um, discussion that we had in James about, um, was it James when we were talking about that? We were talking about, uh, what was it, last Thursday, we were talking about the spiral of, um, oh, he's just testing me, he's testing me. Mm -hmm. And um, I turned around and shared that, and that person was very grateful Oh, as well. there you we, go. Both, we both do that quite a bit to each other so it was nice to share it and then have her be just excited just as excited as I was I was gonna um remind you or rat you out that <laughs> <laughs> you've you've told me about a few times where you've shared things like in surgery with some of our coworkers and things. And it sounds like, I mean, maybe you don't like getting up front, but it sounds like you're finding <laughs> opportunities in other ways. <laughs> yeah, it's come out a, a few. Katie's a good times. talker. She, she, she's got plenty of good stuff to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think the one that was actually most impactful was uh, Bobby's and I little therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was telling him about the uh, forgive like he does and love like he does. There's a, you, John, you posted it. I, I wasn't there for that one. 
but I was mm-hmm. telling him about that one. And then, um, I had some questions about that. So Bobby and I had discussed that privately and I was telling him a little bit about that. And they were like, you know, I've heard you and Barb talking about these meetings and it's starting to sound like you're getting a lot out of it. It's not just, <laughs> it's not just, uh, you know, about scripture or whatever. And that actually sounds like something I would want to do. I mean, they haven't done it, but they, uh, they liked it. Well, they were, I think what they were recognizing is that true religion is something that affects every aspect of your life. It's not just a thing you do on the weekends. Yeah. <clears throat> or re- repeating, repeating of scripture verses. Yeah. Right. Well, I was discussing with them about, um, you know, I had told Bobby that I'd been, I've, I've sought several different avenues of fix me and, um, you know, counselors and therapy and whatever else. And, in the like two hours that, you know, Bobby and I talked or however long it was, I got more out of that than I ever did all the other stuff that I've tried. And I couldn't help but wonder if it's because faith is that missing piece that, you know, all the other stuff, I mean, it it has good, there's, there's good things that I did gather from therapy, but there was, it just wasn't quite getting all of it and i think that missing piece is bringing faith into it and bringing god into it and if they did do that i think that that would be a complete um they'd be you know getting all the checks (laughs) they'd be marking all the boxes but unfortunately they they don't have that and it's it's a big piece that's missing yeah and then eventually some of it ends up in conflict with truth but you can't recognize that until you put that piece in and let it kind of grow and then do its work but i was for instance today a little bit uh brain brain swirled by trying to comprehend i was trying to wrap my brain around this thing about validating or invalidating you I'm supposed to validate you or invalidate you. Um, you know, I was trying to figure out what's the, what, 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 what am I supposed to do again? <laughs> and with the modern psychology, for instance, it's, it was, I was reading this thing because I was trying to understand this. And it was, it was giving examples of phrases. People who say these things are invalidating you. And one of those phrases was, I'm sorry that you feel that way. And so someone has analyzed that phrase to mean that what I'm actually saying is, you know, I don't really care what you feel. It's just, it's wrong. You're wrong. And uh, I'm I'm sorry that you have to think so uh, crazily or whatever, but you're wrong. And so that, that's, that would be a real strong invalidate you kind of thing. But I was thinking, you know, I've said that same phrase many, many, actually a lot of times. And I never thought of it that way. I always thought I was saying, uh, I'm, I'm sad that you hurt. I'm, I'm feeling that you're, that you're hurt. And I am sorry about that. And so I'm trying to acknowledge actually that you're hurt, which I think is what they mean by supposed to validate them. (laughs) Anyway. It was really interesting going through this whole um, kind of twisted my brain up today, how complicated this guy. I thought, you know, I, I'm much, I do much better with simpler terms like, do I care about you? Do I communicate that you're valuable and that, that you're, you're worth something and that, that I should treat you no worse than anybody? I should treat you, you know, as good as myself, or whatever. Those, those things I can, I can wrap my head around. But this other one, I don't know, maybe Sherry can explain it to me, this um, validate you or, or invalidate you thing. But I think sometimes what it's doing, where I was going with all that shady was sometimes in that psychological counseling stuff, we're working at trying to keep my selfishness and just somehow make it okay. Instead of where the gospel comes in and goes, oh, yeah, see, that's a problem. <clears throat> not, not you. 
and we're not we're not devaluing you, but we're going to stay. So you got this illness called cancer, and if you'd like, uh, we could fix that, right? So it's actually going to remove the selfishness problem by not condemning people, but by looking at what God is really like and how much he loves and cares about you. So by love, love is awakened. <clears throat> That's a much better system, but it is going to go after like, like the jugular. It's going to go after our self-dependence and our selfishness and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And too often in, in psychology stuff, we're working at some way to keep that and just make it so we can function together of uh, being selfish or whatever. <clears throat> so that's what I mean by it. some of it does end up con conflicting. With the validation and the invalidation or whatever the other one was, that was one of the things that my husband and I learned with my episodes is um, learning to say, I'm sorry that you're having an anxiety attack and learning to actually say, you are having one. Why? And so it puts him in the situation instead of putting him outside of the situation watching. So instead of oh. telling me, instead of telling me, I'm sorry that you're having anxiety today, he tells me, you are having anxiety. Do you want to cry about it? Or you are having anxiety. Do you, um, why, I guess, or include me in it instead of just saying, you know, I'm sorry for your loss and moving on. <laughs> <laughs> there, that was it. See how you said it at the end. That was a good example. That communicated lack of interest, lack of value, lack of I care about you, right? <laughs> right. Right. So, so that my question is the phrase, I'm sorry you're having an anxiety attack. Um, for instance, how did we learn that it was that meaning it was not interested don't care don't want to deal with you don't want to get you know be be helpful to you where did we decide I mean, that, that was, well, that was one of my questions today is wait a minute how did we say that's what it meant <laughs> so i can say from my side i never knew about this whole thing until they asked me my response they asked me my responses and so when he would say, I'm sorry that you're feeling that way, I would just say, it's all right, I'll get over it. It's and then all I, right, I'll get over yeah, it. and then I walk into the other room, you know, like, it's all right, just don't watch me cry, I'm fine. Now, if he says, I see you're having anxiety, what's going on, that allows me to say why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling. So isn't part of it, this is kind of what I was working on with it today, isn't part of it that we we actually have emotions that get connected to phrases or words. <laughs> and so, for instance, if I say to an Adventist that the investigative judgment already began, they will have an emotional response because of whatever they were taught that phrase means right mm -hmm. if i had said it to you when we first met you'd have said and because what is that <laughs> yeah <laughs> right so, yeah so if i if i experience a phrase like let's say i experience the phrase i love you but the experience that comes with it <clears throat> is the same disinterest don't really care get out of my hair just go away because i love you uh uh, <clears throat> it's really hard for that person then to hear that phrase and not, not be emotionally connected to the experience of it, right? Yeah. So in good counseling, I would say it's true. We Language is only a tool. We don't, it's not magical phrases. <clears throat> so what you went through, I would say, given listening to you describe it, is where you felt for maybe reasons that were old, maybe reasons that were baggage from other relationships, maybe from the one with Trey, but either way, <clears throat> that that statement to you had an emotional connection that made you believe you had to <clears throat> not ask for help. You had to not open up. You had to say, you know, I'll be okay. 
kind of thing. Like, yeah, I know something's wrong with me, but I'll be okay. <clears throat> so once you learn that, good counseling would say, well, first of all, let's find out that you are super valuable. And even if other people don't know you are, you still are. And here's why. And then we connect with God. We understand why. And then pretty soon, uh, you would be able to hear someone say, I'm sorry that you're struggling with that. And if it was coming from a person that you understood, cared about you, loved you, and, and wanted to really help, it would have a different emotional experience. But in the counseling, what you did is you went through the activity of learning different phrases that didn't have, I think they call it uh, triggers or, you know, triggers all this emotional stuff. And that's really just playing with words and communication to find a new emotional experience. It's not really bad. <clears throat> but the part I was struggling, maybe you can help me with this one, Shady, since you learned that validation thing. The question that I had today that I was trying to have other people help me find an answer for is let's, I'll use the example of my, my little girl, Anna, she's 11. And she, she'd be horrified if she knew I was telling you this story, but I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. Don't tell her. I told you. <laughs> she, I got this new treadmill, and she was curious and playing around. Nobody was watching. And she stuck her hand in and got it stuck, in, and the, the belt was burning her hand. And it took her a few seconds to get it unstuck. Anyway, she was very embarrassed. You know, didn't want anybody to know. And <clears throat> pretty soon I hear that mom is coming all the way from Arden, about you know, 30 minutes away to come down and put some ointment on her hand. And I was thinking, wait a minute, what, what do you mean ointment on your hand? Why do you need ointment on your hand? And then she finally tells me, I'm thinking, wait, why, why wouldn't you tell me? So I could have gotten you ointment, you know, and saved the 30 minutes of mom having to come down here. Anyway, so her emotional response was, she was embarrassed, she was afraid, and she didn't want grandma to tease her about it. Okay, so I recognize that, wait a minute, this is so scary that you're going to hide in the bedroom for 45 minutes and call mom and whatever, right? So I'm trying to work this through with her. <laughs> and so my question about validation was, in that moment, when she's very vulnerable and, and at risk and she's emotionally struggling, she's also believing a lie, believing the lie in this case about grandma, maybe me too. What what does it mean that I need to validate her right there in that piece of the scenario? <clears throat> validate Anna. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. How do you, I mean <laughs> Well, and let me let me explain my question a little more to help because I was trying to figure out does that mean I need to say to her, you're right, grandma is really mean sometimes, and so you know it's I'm you're having those feelings and they're real because grandma does that. Um, is that val is that what they mean? Validate her? <laughs> I don't know. Cause would that encourage her to hide even more? Well, I would think if it's a lie that grandma is like that, like, like we all experience things with her. I remember my grandpa, I was scared to death of him <laughs> when I was, you know, eight and 10 years old, eight, seven and eight years old. Um, but we all experience that a little bit. And over time, most of us, and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about extreme abuse and physical abuse. Some of those kids never experience a reconciliation with their parents. But a lot of us experience that, well, actually, my fear wasn't really based on very good truth, because we find out later, like my grandpa, who was so mean, that's my mom's dad. Um, when I was older, like 17 or whatever, you know, just before he died, I remember being at their house again. And one, he was much smaller. You know, I'd gotten very big from when I was seven years old. So he was much smaller. He was smaller than me. And <clears throat> uh, I, it occurred to me listening to him talk that he was actually trying to be funny. And, you know, when I was seven or eight, he didn't seem funny at all. He was I didn't want to go in the house. <laughs> so later I learned that, oh yeah, maybe, maybe I just had a seven-year-old's perspective on that and I didn't really understand what grandpa was talking about or whatever. You know, we 
we experience that. So again, my question is about my 11 year old. Do I validate her? What does that mean? I, I think it means communicate to her that I care about her, that I love her, that she's not in trouble. I'm not judging her. Even if she's confused about grandma, I'm not criticizing her for that or judging her for that. So that she knows that um, I care enough that she trusts me. <clears throat> then I could add, oh, and by the way, uh, maybe you know some of that stuff you're thinking about grandma isn't all true. We could work on that. You know, I mean, essentially that's what we do with people who are confused about God. We don't tell them they're stupid. We don't tell them they're confused or yeah, it's just because you're deceived. That's kind of a, you know, you're not you're not important statement versus helping them slowly understand, wait a minute, there's another way to look at that. If you read this and read that and take a look here. And when we get done, they might be hurt that we are, you know, showing them that they're wrong. And they might say to me, uh, you know what, you, you're not validating me at all. <laughs> so that's what I was trying to evaluate. What, what is this thing about validating there's actually um, a phrase that comes up quite frequently anymore that perception is reality. Yeah. Uh, just recently came up in a silly training that I have to go through. We, we have to do these trainings um, being state employees um, like over and over every single year we have to take these sensitivity type trainings. And that was one that came up during my training and I just sat there thinking that is so bogus <laughs> Just, <laughs> I, I mean because basically the way that it's presented is if I say something and you interpret it in a certain way that hurts your feelings that's reality it has no that's no real. bearing on what my intent was what I meant by that there's no room for having communication to discuss what did I really mean by that? I, you know, or anything. It was just like, if you perceive it that way, that is reality. And therefore Whoa. I'm now a sister, you know, whatever, you know, because I said this thing, you know, <laughs> this forbidden word or something. <laughs> um, yeah. And it, it, I've experienced that with people reacting in that way. And it makes no difference what you meant by it, you know, at all. It's just how they took it and they were offended. And therefore that is reality. <laughs> um, and it's really, uh, it, it's difficult. I would agree. It, it's it's reality that they're offended, right? But the question, but it's also the question reality is, that I had an intent and a meaning to the words that I said. You right. Know, the question is, why are they thoroughly what they interpreted? <laughs> yeah, which is why I my question usually is, well, okay, but why are you offended? <laughs> right. <clears throat> I, I had an experience, a, 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 you know, several years ago, where um, I'm sitting at my at, at my computer mm -hmm. and having one of those days where the computer was just lagging slow, like just incredibly slow, to the point that you almost can't even get anything done. And I made a comment that my computer was being retarded, which the definition of retarded is <laughs> well, you know, but somebody you know, like the next row over, heard me and got super offended that I used the R word as she would, as she kept saying it, you know, you used the yeah. R word, you can't use that R word, it's offensive. And <laughs> it, made, it made no difference to her whatsoever, that I wasn't referring to a person as being retarded in some derogatory way. You know, I was talking about an inanimate object that was slow. <laughs> and yeah, yeah and and just, just the fact that she got just horribly offended, almost to the point of reporting me, you know, and getting me written up or something for using this forbidden word. And <laughs> it just, it, it goes beyond even using common sense, you know, in communication. Well, and when, I'm, when I'm thinking of gospel and actually helping people, because yes, it's true. Well, in, reality, in reality, she was offended. But <clears throat> for no good reason is your point. Right. And... So, is it reality that you meant what she took it as? That's that's a different question. So, I think part of why this is so confusing to me, particularly, is because in a in a given communication, even just five minutes worth with somebody, 
there's a whole bunch of stuff that might need to get validated or invalidated, uh, especially if you're going to deal with what's the truth of the matter, what's the facts, or what did I, what did you mean versus what you said. If you talk for five minutes, we might have a list of you know 25 things that I want to know what what did you mean by that and what did you mean by that. So, <clears throat> valid. I looked up validating in the uh, dictionary and it says to establish that something is true. And invalidating is to basically reverse that, to say, you know, prove that something is not true. So, so I was like, oh, I wonder if what they're really saying is that anytime I disagree with what they're saying, I'm invalidating them, the person, uh, versus invalidating the facts or the information, right? I'd be in real trouble because I'm going up against false ideas all the time. <laughs> You know, Sabbath, the people that came over, <clears throat> they could go away really offended because I brought up an article the next day uh, that basically showed that, look, we shouldn't be barking up that tree. So quit quit even chasing that thing. And they could feel really insecure and angry and say that, you know, I invalidated them or the new term is that I learned is gaslighting. <laughs> I gaslighted them. I was like, what? What is that? <laughs> I had to look that up. <clears throat> I would want to know with, um, I mean, I don't have kids, but I would want to know where the reasoning behind why she wouldn't want to say anything. Did she not want to say anything because grandma would say, are you stupid? Didn't you know that if you stuck your hand in there, it would get caught? <laughs> Or would she say, um, just no reasoning behind it, but get mad at her. So right. what's making me think about that is I was telling Barb a story today about, um, I grew up with fairly, um, one-sided, I guess, kind of authority. So because I said so, or, right. um you know, things like that. So things as simple as a glass of water. It didn't matter if it was a plastic glass. It didn't matter if it was a Dixie cup, but if I poured water accidentally on the ground that was not on the table, that was like, this is why we can't have nice things. You are irresponsible. You can't even take care of your cup. <laughs> Sometimes it was that. Other times, yeah, that was, that was yeah, dumb other times it was just straight up this is why we don't have nice things. So part of me is wondering, was I, when I would spill water and I cried, was it because one, I knew I would get yelled at or two, I was solidifying that I was stupid and irresponsible and couldn't even take care of a glass of water or was it both? You mean to so, them, what was it? Huh? You mean, what was it to them? Or ask, ask your question again. You're the, wondering. What I'm wondering what was going through my mind was, am I solidifying the thought of, they told me I couldn't have my water in this carpet because I was irresponsible. And I just proved to myself that I am irresponsible mm -hmm. and worthless and, you know, mm -hmm. all these other things. So was I... Was I crying because I was upset at myself or was I crying because I knew I would get in trouble? So I got my question about Anna is, is she upset and didn't want to say anything because she's embarrassed of her own actions or is she upset because she just knows that grandma's going to yell at her because that's what grandmas do. Well, when <laughs> Cause I, I had her. a grandma that no matter what I did, I was getting yelled at it. Like it did not matter what it was. Anytime she talked to me, it was always yelling, yeah. even if it was like, go set the table, like, get out of the kitchen, go set the table. I'm like, okay, okay, I'm going all right. You know, so. Well, so with Anna, when, when I saw Anna, what I read, the biggest part was embarrassed that, that it happened. Like it, it, something that you shouldn't do, shouldn't have happened. Not because anybody told her that. I mean, it never even occurred to me that you could hurt yourself on the treadmill. <laughs> so <laughs> we, there was no 
you know, preemptive discussion about this or, <clears throat> but let's say, let's say that I see her there and um, she's holding her hand, it's an hour later and she's got, you know, water in her eyes because she's embarrassed and she's afraid to tell me because of what my response might be. And I, and let's say that I say to her, <clears throat> um, oh, curiosity got the cat again. <laughs> and let's say I've never even used that phrase before with her, right? It doesn't matter uh, whether she knows what those words actually are, what would she hear? Uh, I would assume sarcasm. And probably the idea that, yep, here it goes again. You just do this all the time. Yeah. Even though she's never done that before, <laughs> yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. So because that that's the way I said it. But what if I said very softly and gently, whoa, uh oh, did curiosity get the cat? Um, and then moved in close and looked at her hand and got some ointment and helped her with it and never made a comment about it being stupid or childish or whatever. Um, I would be conveying a different message with the same words is my point. Yeah. <laughs> so the question about grandma, for instance, um, and in this part I am aware of. So my grandpa, who I was just describing, he was kind of mean. Um, he never hit us. But one time we were playing this, so I'm seven years old and we're playing a game called Stratego, which I thought was a great fun game, but I'd never played with him before. And <clears throat> so I'd played with my sisters who were easy to beat was what I remember. And I'm playing with grandpa and he's not so easy to beat. So I, I cheated. I moved a little piece over and he caught me. And so he took the whole board game and he threw it up in the air and he said, if you're going to cheat, then I ain't playing with you. <laughs> And I remember thinking, oh, wow, I've never seen anybody throw a board game before. <laughs> so after that, he could say this phrase, and he did this almost daily. I would come home from school, and I'd come in the house. And the first thing I wanted to know is, where's mom? Right? Because if mom's not here, it's not safe to come in the house. So I'm going to go back outside. So I'd say, where's mom? And he'd say, well, if you tell me, then we'll both know. Well, you know, later when I was a teenager and I saw him say those kind of things, I realized he was actually trying to be funny. It wasn't necessarily funny, but he he was trying to be funny in his weird sort of odd humorous way. And it didn't feel the same, even though it was the same phrase, <clears throat> it didn't feel the same to me anymore like it did when I was eight years old, right? So um, so anyway, I was just talking about grandpa to say, so my mom is only a little fraction of what he was in that area. So she might make <clears throat> comments to Anna, like Anna, Anna, when she comes here, she has way less rules than a mom. So, you know, she'll go to the freezer at will and eat ice cream. And then in one weekend, the whole quart of ice cream is gone. Right. So grandma might say, uh, are you going to eat anything besides ice cream today? Well, Somehow Anna has been learning that that is, she never used this phrase, but I'm learning that today. Somehow she's learning that that's invalidating. <laughs> <laughs> that that's, that's putting her down. That's, uh, you know, whatever. Even though at mom's house, which is weird, that that's kind of where the connection is. At mom's house, no, she's not allowed to have ice cream hardly at all, right? So anyway, I think part of it is the guilt of, knowing that she's eating so much ice cream, added that to that grandma's comment. I remember as a kid, you know, half of it was just me feeling guilty uh, or, or um, embarrassed, right? <clears throat> and it was way less about what the adults were actually doing around me than it was, at least in my house. Uh, <clears throat> however, I know that's not the case in all houses. And there are a lot of places where gaslighting or, you know, I call it um, a very poor treatment or very um, unkind treatment. Like I don't feel either to my kids or anybody else for that matter that I ever wanna communicate to somebody that I think you're stupid. Um, I, I don't, I mean, you can come up with 50 different ways to say that. I don't ever want to intentionally communicate 
that idea in any way, shape, or form. Doesn't mean that sometimes that the doesn't mean that people don't sometimes feel like that. And so that's where I was keying in on what Sherry was saying. I think that, you know, uh, in Sherry's position, in her story, we have to be able to say, well, and here I go again, saying, I'm sorry that I made you feel that way. <laughs> well, I got to learn a new phrase now, because <laughs> apparently if I say that, I'm telling them that, uh, that I'm not interested at all. But anyway, so <clears throat> however we say that, you know, I'm I didn't mean to hurt your feelings and I see that it does hurt your feelings and I'm willing to hear and understand why. So I understand you better, but if they're not willing to hear what my actual intent was, um, then I would say, yeah, it's going to be difficult to have any fix of that communication, right? Because they're going to be stuck believing what they believe. That's Sherry's concern about feelings are reality or perception is reality. Uh, that doesn't make it reality. If I, every time you say something shady, if I just assume I know what you meant and then I take offense and I never tell you, uh, or I treat you, you know, short, sharp, you know, don't talk nice because I'm offended by what you said, but I never give you a chance to say, but what did you mean? Yeah, it's going to be, I'm pretty much going to be someone you can't communicate very well with. <laughs> Isn't that a, at least at, at some level, a form of self-righteousness if you won't yes. allow yourself, your thinking to be corrected? Yeah, we put it in biblical terms, it is. It's self-righteous, it's <clears throat> better than thou, it's only my way, whatever I think and see, that's the only way it can be. Versus, I, you know, as a communicator <clears throat> who wants to communicate the gospel more than anything else, um, I... I strongly believe and try to practice that it's more important for me to figure out what you mean than to get stuck on what you said so if you say something even if it's very not nice sounding and i say well could you tell me what you mean by that and you explain very different than i first took it i'm going to go with what you said the second time uh and even if you make it worse the second time uh, because now you're you're adding more maybe detail, maybe more feeling, maybe more whatever, but I'm going to, okay, that, that, that is what you meant, or you didn't mean what you said, or whatever. You know, I asked the guy today, <clears throat> a very difficult person to deal with, and <clears throat> they have, I'll just say they've been doing a bunch of negative things, and in this process of it, there was this email that they sent to the attorney general <clears throat> that actually named me and uh, said what I said. And it had to do with renters and, and where I used to work and managing and their electricity and whatever. <clears throat> but in the email they sent to the attorney general, they said something that I said, and it wasn't what I said. So I emailed both the sender and the attorney general uh, and <clears throat> said, I'm, I'm sorry to even have to you know, um, use our time on this, but I want to make sure that one thing is clear. And then I re-explained what I said. So that other person then sent another email to the attorney general and, and courtesy copied me that basically called me a liar. You know, basically just said that I was not telling the truth. So, <clears throat> so now today I got to go up there and meet with them face to face because um, they're supposed to get their rent money to me um, and they're a week late, but since I'm going up there anyway, they want me to stop by and pick it up. <laughs> so, so I said to him today, I said, so I just want to tell you that, because I'm trying to explain to him actually about you know, how he treats the owner. It doesn't really, I'm not concerned about me near as much as the owner. But I said to him, so you know the other day you guys sent another email about me to the attorney general in which you called me a liar. <laughs> he, he said to me, what do you mean? We didn't call you a liar. I said, well, hold on. Is it true that if I say something and you say to somebody else that I said that, and then I try to clarify for both of you what I meant, and then you, you say, that's not true. That's calling me a liar, isn't it? And he, he got very worked up. And I said, listen, I, it doesn't even matter to me. You tell me right now what you actually want to you know, communicate to me, and I'll go with that. Like, we'll just toss all that out and I'll just can pretend or go with the fact that you didn't call me a liar. If you tell me right now, 
how you'd rather that communication for me to take it. And really, I was just trying to give him an example of how when you say things or you call the lawyer or you call the attorney general, you're going to make the owner freak out and panic because of the way you're acting. And um, anyway, so I was just, it was interesting to me because I, I really think that I, I believe that and that I am more interested in what you mean than what you actually said. So tell me now again what you mean, and I'll, I'll go with that. And if you change what you said, uh, I wouldn't even have to throw that in your face. Like, it's okay, good, I like that, let's go with that. <laughs> and I think that that would properly be treating people with kindness, forgiveness, and considerateness all at the same time. Um, so I was trying to figure out on the way home from that, okay, now, did, did I validate that guy or not validate? <laughs> trying to figure out how to fit that word in there. I still can't figure it out. So that was my brain whirlwind on that stuff today. So what did you say, Shady? I did validate him or I didn't validate him? <laughs> I don't know. I my validation uh is such a different type i feel like there is all sorts of validations like these participation awards that everybody seems to have to have i think that is a validation in itself what does that um, mean i mean uh what do you mean awards what i don't know what that means um my perspective, of course, is it seems like nowadays um, there's no such thing as just, you know, one person doing something great and being acknowledged for it. That's not inclusive. Oh. So they have to include everybody so that they can mm -hmm. validate everybody yeah, yeah. and not so invalidate these other people. So I think I, there's... I I think the word validate and invalidate can be used so interchangeably that it's hard to, are you validating somebody or are you encouraging someone? Are you validating them or are you um, including them? I guess it's, it, it's in my, in my mind, the definition of validate could be all sorts of things. Yeah, which may, maybe that's why I'm so confused. I mean, are you validating Anna by saying, yes, that does suck what you did. That is embarrassing. I would be embarrassed as well. <laughs> like, is she going to take that? <laughs> is she going to take that as, oh, dad understands how I feel. I'm so thankful. Or is she going to take that? He's making fun of me. That were me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because that's what I heard. <laughs> yeah. So then, then what Sherry is saying has to be the next step, which is perception has to become reality. Because it doesn't matter what you said; it matters what I what I got out of it. Right. When Dre tells me, um, "Yes, you are not okay." You know, when he, I had a, I had a, like a total episode where I was in the hospital, and. I went there because I thought I was having a heart attack. Unbeknownst to me, I'm having a panic attack. So I'm like hysterical, hyperventilating, uncontrollable crying. I just can't get myself together. And he walks in and he's like, you know, the doctor, you know, lets him in and he tells, he tells him as I'm like cowering in the, in the corner, just, you know, having an absolute meltdown. The doctor is telling him, you know, she's having a panic attack you need to take her to um, a therapist. Yeah. We can't do anything with her here. And so the way Dre thinks to comfort me is to tell me it's okay. You're strong I'm You're gonna through this. <laughs> and the doctor tells him, he stops him right there. And he's like, no, you need to tell her and acknowledge that she's not okay. Because right now she's feeling like she's crazy and no one understands her. And the only way to make her feel like you understand is acknowledging that, yes, you are having a problem. You're not okay right now. So that's how he validates my feelings of I'm feeling very confused and very crazy. 
instead of saying, no, you're not, you're fine. And making me feel worse. He validates me by saying, yes, you are having a problem. Why are we having a problem? Talk to me. So, yeah, so I, that's the take, taking time to understand you activity. Right. Because I mean, everyone in this group, can you say when somebody says, I'm sorry, is your response, okay, they just opened up the door for me to explain everything? Or is your response, oh, I know, thank you. Right. It just ends right there. Which is why true communication can never be very good on text because you get these one little sort of statements and you're not sure what what is all behind that. <laughs> <laughs> It takes body language and facial expressions and emotion all wrapped together. Because um, I was going to say, it's interesting because what the doctor said for him to tell you would not work for me. If we go to the doctor and my leg is gushing blood and bleeding, and you say to me, you know what, you're not okay, let's hurry up and get to the doctor. That That's not going to help me. <clears throat> I'm going <laughs> to... Be like, okay, you can't drive. <laughs> I think we gotta get, I, someone, gotta get someone who can drive that that believes we can be okay. <laughs> I think that's a difference between physical manifestation and internal manifestation. Sure. I can look at something and obviously we can both acknowledge that it's broken. You know, Dre and I right. can both acknowledge I have a laceration and it's bleeding. We can both see that, but he can't see how I feel in my brain. He can't right. see or feel the manic behavior that I'm feeling. He can see the physical manifestation of it, but he can't understand or comprehend what I'm actually thinking, which is I'm crazy and everyone thinks that I'm, think crazy, I'm or, crazy or something's wrong with me, but no one else thinks that anything is wrong with me. I know something's wrong, but no one else seems to know or understand that something's wrong. Well, so an extreme of that would be for everybody to be telling you, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. Right. <laughs> Which is, you just... well, it starts with self-sabotage because that's what you tell yourself. Anytime you're stressed out, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. And then everyone else tells you that you're fine, but you know that you're not fine. <laughs> <clears throat> That's why when people ask me uh, if I'm fine or how I'm doing, like today at the doctor, I met a new, new doctor today, and she asked me, how you doing? I said, uh, fine, as far as I know. You might tell me something else here in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Well, I think that's why I like, I think that's why maybe I latched on to Romans so much, because I feel like Romans is validating the fact that I can't do this yeah. and no human can do this, but here is the answer. And it's all in, yeah. for me, it's all in Romans. I don't have to like search more script. I can search more scriptures to validate those scriptures, but in Romans, <laughs> I feel like it plainly says you can't do this as a human being. You need me. And this is why. And here's all the situations that you're going to find yourself in authority situations, sin situations, you know, all these things. You're right. You can't do it. And you're never going to be able to do it. And you're just relying on self. But do you, that's feel, not that, true. That, do you feel that Romans then helps to use our word is helping to validate you? It, yeah. There's multiple things in Romans that helped validate my feelings of I can't do this or mm -hmm. um you know I was having a problem with um the whole I was like convinced that we were going to go to war with Syria this is how <laughs> this is like how my anxiety manifests these things that I can't control control me and so I'm in my house and I'm like I've been in the military. We're like, I know how things go. We're definitely going to go to war with Syria and it's, it's going to be an apocalypse. Like this is the end of times. I just know it. And I'm just, I'm just sitting there and just, you know, the wheels are turning and I'm trying to figure out like, what am I going to do? Am I going to be sitting in my house and I'm just going to be bombed? Like what's going to happen? 
and I was reading Romans at the time and it went to the part about, um, you know, listening to your authority and how God has placed these leaders in these positions. And that what I was able to completely remove myself. And I felt like it validated the scripture saying that it's not up to me. It's actually up to him. And so now I can just let that go and remember that you're right. You can't do anything <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> it's okay that you aren't going to be able to control the situation because I've already got it. I've got it. So to me, what I just heard you do was take validating you and, and creating a scenario where truth, which is solid truth, not, you know, based on emotion or nothing like you can't, even if you don't believe it, it's still true which is God, God has your back. God, God's taking care of it. God's in charge. You took truth and you embraced the truth idea and it, and it validated or gave you a sh assurance or reassurance and allowed you to let go of the panic as if you could have fixed it anyway. Is that what you just did? Yeah, I have. I, my biggest problem is control. And mm -hmm. so I keep telling myself, I can't control the situation. I can't, why can't, why can't I, why can't I, I have zero control. I have zero control. The scriptures tell me you're right. You don't. So, so don't even worry about it. Give it to me. So it validated your belief that you weren't supposed to be controlling it. Right. Okay. So let's say that, that so I, I like that. I agree with that. And that, that works really well. And I think in the scenario of the gospel, the gospel is going to give that kind of validation to Peter when he recognizes that he's not able and he gives his life over to Christ and Christ never treated him with no value or, or low value of any kind, right? So Christ treated him with respect, kindness, and love. But if Peter had never acknowledged uh, that he couldn't control it and that he needed to find, figure out how to control it, then everything Jesus said, I don't think would have, he wouldn't have found any validation in that. He's going to keep finding invalidation, right? Every time he listens to what Jesus says, it's going to invalidate his belief because his belief is wrong. So that would have been like Judas. <clears throat> so to me, there's the trouble with uh, what Sherry was saying about if it's all relative, relative to how you feel, then we're never going to really have truth that cuts between truth and lie that validates truth as truth and lie as lie. And then you can decide, do you want to be validated by watching what happens if you actually do what God says and surrender to him and watch what he can do with that? Or you can try to invalidate God. And I don't know what that does as far as validating you, but you're never going to, I don't think you're going to find any validation there. In the end, it says the wicked are going to bow the knee and confess that he was right and true, which would validate God in a sense. Not that God needs any validation, but I mean, uh, it just says that he's true, that he's right. And, and they're going to find in that activity everything that they wanted validated that was important to them is going to get unvalidated. No, um, it's not fixable. <clears throat> anyway, to me, that's just where my brain goes with these, with these words, and I'm trying to wrap my head around what people are saying. Because, because I, I was talking to my other daughter. I'll finish with this little story, because uh, I wanted her to help me understand this. And listening to her, I started to. It's where I started to realize. Wait a minute. So this phrase that used to mean this thing to me, you know, from when I was a kid, today you've learned that that phrase means something different. So I really do need to learn, okay, so what do you hear when you hear that phrase? Otherwise, I'm unintentionally communicating a uh, wrong idea by using a phrase the way, and, and they've got their ideas. So I don't want to run around, for instance, and say to everybody, hey, don't you know that the investigative judgment already started? <laughs> or, you know, in, in the Adventist church. Or, or that uh, you only got a couple of days left of the investigative judgment or whatever. 
um, because all that does is evoke uh, fear and scare. And I think when I was analyzing today about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, in the context that I read on the website today, Jesus did not validate that guy. He loved the guy, and he communicated to him that he was willing to have a conversation and to talk, and, and even to acknowledge that the man wanted to become a disciple, which is why he said to him, okay, so here's all you got to do. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. But but that completely invalidated his entire um, belief system up to that point. <clears throat> and it says the man went away sad. And I would say today, psychology would probably say, yeah, he went away sad because Jesus didn't validate him. You know, he didn't, he didn't say, yeah, you've done pretty good. Uh, you know, just got one thing left to do. He didn't, he didn't say that. Um, but, but that's just my brain playing around with the words. So, <laughs> But that, I think that's the difference of perspective because there's some personalities that they need that. They need, need what? they need that validation first. Like there are some rich young rulers that they need you to say, you're right. You have done everything really well. However, you have one more thing. And then there's other personalities that they don't need that. They don't need any encouragement at all they just need to know what's the next step and that's when it, i think and i think that's when it comes into your truth sherry when you were talking about their perspective is reality in a couple in one friendship that i have um she calls it her truth well that's my truth and um i hear that a lot and we've had discussions before where we've just had to agree to disagree. Okay. That's your truth. This is my truth. <laughs> and I think that's where it comes in because the person who needs that encouragement first, that the person who needs that positive reinforcement first, but they don't get it. All they're going to hear is, well, I'm not good enough because they didn't say anything good about me. All they said was, I still have something else to do. I'm not good enough well, I, because I still have something else to do. So I think that's, uh, Mary Magdalene versus the rich young ruler, meaning Mary Magdalene was already downtrodden. She was hurting, right? And Jesus, though he never gave her validation that she had done well, um, he gave her the, the value communication. He he said to her, you know, I don't condemn you, <clears throat> and 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 then opened up the possibility that she could change. Um, she heard in him, it says in Desire of Ages, she saw and heard in him love and hope. So somehow, whatever the words were, that, that got communicated, and she needed that. Whereas the rich young ruler, he was a little self-absorbed, and I think needed the challenge of taking down his tower of self a little bit. We call it <clears throat> pride, right? Yeah. Um, so... I do agree. Different people need a different sort of um, approach. And, and I, that's where I have to default and say, you know, I'm going to have to have the Holy Spirit really lead all this because uh, I get so confused after a day like this. I'm like, I better not even open my mouth. <laughs> I better just go sit in my closet. <laughs> so, but the Holy Spirit who knows them, right? When we surrender, that this is where we started on this whole conversation in the first place was I think that the Holy Spirit then, who knows them, can speak through us to communicate, and it will be in more than words. It's going to have to be actual love in the heart coming out towards them. And that whole discussion about valid or not valid, I think, will fade away, uh, like for Mary, who had been maybe to a lot of counseling, but all of a sudden, none of that mattered, because what mattered was, here was a guy who... who she perceived that he was holy, whatever she thought that was. He wasn't just some guy off the street. He was even more holy than the Pharisees and the Sadducees, <clears throat> right, from her perspective. And yet uh, she wanted to come back to him again and again and again. So in one way, we would say, well, she must have felt validated then. Well, she felt valued for sure. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to fit the validated word in there, but the way you're describing it, I think, is exactly what happened to her. She she felt that there was 
hope for her. There was a way out. There was change that needed to happen. And he was offering the solution, just like you described in Romans. I think she got all of that out of that little interaction with Jesus, which, you know, I, the Holy Spirit knows how to pull that off. I don't. <laughs> I, think anyway, a lot I, of it is, I think a lot of it is self-training too. You're self-taught. Um, I mean, I taught Dre for unbeknownst to me. I taught Dre for the first five or six years of our marriage to not deal with me when I um, am emotional. Right. And so it wasn't even, it wasn't even um, distrust in him. It was more how I had trained him. So anytime right. I cried, it wasn't like I got mad at him because he left me alone. That's what I had trained him to do. Mm. I didn't know that I needed him to actually be there and watch me cry. I didn't know that I needed these things until... I was at the point of no return and crazy <laughs> and somebody had to tell me <laughs> you need to, you know, and he had to tell both of us, you need to be present. I mean, it, it took him two seconds to, to become a completely different person. It took me a lot longer because I had trained myself to not tolerate that behavior from myself and from, from other people. But he doesn't have to ask me what's going on anymore because I know when he says he's sorry now that it's okay for me to elaborate. I don't need him to ask me what's wrong. When he says I'm sorry, I, I already know that I can go on about my day even though he didn't even ask me about it and he's going to care. Well, what's beautiful, one I'd say, I think that's because the, when you said change in two seconds, I think that's because the heart, his heart was already there, just needed the tools to figure out how to get that through to you. Yeah. And, and that same scenario you're describing is actually what God does with us, meaning not, not that he didn't know us, but I mean, we have certain things that we react to or have <clears throat> thoughts or beliefs towards him. And he's working on taking those things apart. Uh, not too fast, or we'd come unglued, right? But he works on them a little at a time, and he's, he's etching away at the wrong responses and wrong ideas and wrong beliefs. But to me, truth isn't, isn't a piece that you should move around because it is the solution. And when I say truth, you know, I mean truth about God. <clears throat> truth about whether the table is actually here or not. I, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> truth about God that is where everything starts to solidify. So you were learning, let's say in the example you just gave, you were learning the truth about Dre's, is it Dre or Trey? Dre as in doctor. Dre, so you were learning Dre's heart in the matter, whether he was willing to hear more or not, whether he wanted to hear more or not, whether he was okay with you not being okay. You know, all of that stuff you then began to learn. So I think we experience the same thing with God. He's just infinitely patient and infinitely wise, which is why he's so good at it. Um, and then it gets very confusing for me, but <laughs> but he's good at slowly etching. You know, that's why only by love is love awakened. Uh, only truth can conquer over lie. Those Those things are still real. And as soon as we choose to live in a, a world where your truth, my truth, got nine different truths, but we don't ever compare them to what is the real truth, then we'll, we'll just be dizzy all the time. Well, I agree better. with you that. I think I it gets with better because when, once you learn, somebody, yeah, once you learn, it's quicker to react. So before I was, before I was asking God for help, I just wasn't. And then when I started to, I was kind of doing it occasionally, you know, and then it kind of just turns into, I'm doing it immediately. Yeah, because it, it becomes like with, with Dre, you now know what he's thinking a lot about all this because you've been around the merry-go-round with him several times. And I think uh, I do agree with you, though, what you were saying before about like our friends, sometimes we do have to just be okay 
with letting them hold on to their whatever they call it truth. I'm just going to call it opinions <clears throat> um, and not judge them and criticize them for that. So I don't need to invalidate, to use our word, the person, even though I'm trying to invalidate their wrong idea. Um, but that never happens because I just keep telling them how wrong they are, right? That, that, that never helps anybody at a heart level. So to that end, yes, that's the not judging, not criticizing, not condemning part that Jesus had when he wrote in the sand on the guys that were going to feel self-condemned and leave, right? He, he wasn't having any condemnation for them. He was trying to help them understand how much uh, trouble they had gotten themselves into that he had come to rescue them from. But um, that's always his attitude, which is so different than so much of our abuse relationship stuff where we're <clears throat> criticizing and condemning and judging others and you should just be like me and if you were just like me then you'd be fine and you know all that all that kind of communique uh, I think is not helpful or useful <clears throat> so it, it does relate to the gospel to me all of this because it is about how to understand people and what they're going through and what their hurts are to help them uh, turn and look at Jesus look and see I don't mean Bible thumping you know that <clears throat> but turn and look and see how wonderful life is for those of us that now know him um, and, and that they could have that same thing if they want it. And if not, we won't invalidate them as people by calling them names or criticizing them or condemning them, which is so terrible about how much of this so-called Christianity just ends up hate speeching on whatever people they don't agree with or believe with. It's not, not <laughs> well, I ran you over time quite a bit tonight, but thank you for helping me with that conversation. I'm we're trying to work that stuff all through. Did we end up okay on that, Sherry, or, or do I need to spend tomorrow on it too? <laughs> oh, you probably need to study some more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my thought I, I did have a thought about um your interaction with Anna is that validating her would could be just as simple as acknowledging that she had this feeling of fear yeah. you know don't put it down don't negate it you know oh I I understand this is how you felt and it's okay to have that feeling you know right. and then work on her perception of grandma you know or whoever she was afraid was going to make her feel bad you know right. that you know grandma loves you and even if she's teasing you she still loves you and thinks that you're wonderful and you know yeah. you know you can to that extent, you can equate that that to understanding god and god loving us no matter what we do you know as well so <laughs> yeah because i was thinking it was very fairly normal kid stuff yeah um and, and the only thing that from today, now I have to reevaluate and figure out a new phrase to use because I said, I would say, I'm, I'm sorry that you're feeling like you're too, you know, that you're afraid. <laughs> you feel like you can't talk to grandma. So now I have to go, okay, wait a minute. I got to learn a whole new set of words. Now well, I'm, I'm going to say, I, I, I disagree that that's what that phrase means. You know? <laughs> Um, oh, to, to, to me, it would mean that you that you care that I feel that way. You know that you care well, that's, about. That's me. how I. That's how I felt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I when I said it, and I don't mean in any way that Anna is the one that said that I, she right. she hasn't said anything not valid. <laughs> I was just using that as an example of working with someone who is hurt and is scared and is confused, and now. I was trying to understand this thing that I was sent about, you know, have to validate them, whoever them are. So I was trying to just figure out, okay, how do I validate on again? <laughs> anyway. Sherry, are you in psychology? Um, I I took took yeah, I took psychology in in college. That was my major. Okay, is that what you do now? Um, I do social work. Okay. So I, I work with the foster care system. 
Well, kudos to both of you for studying psychology (laughs) because I tried to do that in, I tried to take psychology and sociology in college and I walked out of both classes. I hated them. (laughs) (laughs) I have zero, zero patience. (laughs) Yeah, I'd say working with animals is a lot easier than working with people. (laughs) <laughs> They're way less complicated, right? Barb, you are so nice and kind and graceful, though. <laughs> I don't know if you can use that excuse. Well, and of course, Barb, see in this picture on here that I'm looking at, she didn't have puppies. No. She had little human beings, so it'll get complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, uh, I feel like it's easier to just love and forgive when they're your own little kids and so much harder with other humans. Oh, no, it won't be complicated for you to love and forgive them. It'll be complicated for them until they learn that. (laughs) From what I've seen from Barb interacting with her kids, there's a lot of validation which is weird because it's the complete opposite of how I grew up. So it's weird. It's it's interesting watching it from. Well, I was thinking about different. I was thinking about you in that water, and I was like, "It's okay. It's <laughs> water. It's gonna dry. It's not a big deal." <laughs> and then you're like, you're wondering how why you were feeling that way if it was you or fear of them, and I was like. Oh, it's totally them. Either way, either way, it's their fault for just being harsh to you. They just need to be like, hey, it's just water. It's like PTSD. <laughs> um, I was over there and Isabella was. was getting up on the piano to grab something and she knocked a pumpkin off. And the, pu- the pumpkin went like flying across the floor and the stem fell off. I no joke had PTSD to the point where I could hear authority yelling at me about that pumpkin falling off and the stem breaking off of it and that's why you don't climb on things and uh all barb did was go i'm not mad i'm just worried are you okay and i'm like wow that's that's so loving (laughs) yeah and i can tell you that i never have yelled at anna like that or even (laughs) things like that to anna so it, it, it's interesting. I've got four different kids. Their their responses to all this are four different. I mean, they're four different ways. <laughs> There's none of them exactly reacting or responding exactly the same way. And then you got to figure out how to connect and interact with each one of them. So yeah, it gets it gets uh, it. You know, it it, it it's fun. I, I enjoy it. I I don't. To me, it's not like a problem. I just when I get stuck in some of this information, I'm like, okay, that made me dizzy. I can I get back to just can I just talk nice and love and forgive? That's much easier. <laughs> I agree with Barb. <laughs> well, Shady, you want to have prayer for us tonight? No. Okay, just checking. That's asking too to... much. Well, I just don't want you to feel talking. left out. I don't want you to feel left out, so I got to ask now and again. <laughs> I will never feel left out if I'm never asked to pray. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm right never there with heard. you. <laughs> I'll sound, I'll sound all weird. Like, thank you, Jesus. Okay, amen. Thanks. <laughs> Why is that weird? <clears throat> All right, let's have a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your love and your grace, but I I thank you that you um, can work inside of us to remove the selfish and the stubborn and the the better than thou so that we can really have love in the heart because if it's in us, then it gets communicated automatically. So make us patient and kind and gracious and yet brave enough to say, stuff even if it's not politically correct all the time uh, to really help people see the the need and the value for coming into your kingdom and not just getting lost in all of the merry-go-rounds that we create for ourselves down here so we thank you for your your love and your patience with us uh, thank you for everyone 
uh, in our study group and on the call just because they're encouraging and helpful to me. And to all that, well, again, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. John, I had a question. It's unmuted. Yes. Uh, oh. Um, last Thursday's discussion on James, mm -hmm. it was, I know it was like a two hour presentation, <laughs> but I was more specifically interested when we actually started discussing James, cause I wanted to send that to a friend. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have that? Was that recorded? Probably I can, uh, I can look and see and try and get that uploaded. I go, I go, I go. But but do you want shady? You want just chopped off, so it's just where we started into oh, James, right? I mean, yeah, that's fine. I didn't. I know mm -hmm. that a lot of the beginning was about like the election and stuff, and so I didn't skip. All I didn't that. know how everybody felt about that being on there. I was more interested. Yeah. I was personally more interested in the actual discussion itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can yeah. probably chop that. Yeah. Down. Yeah. Yeah. Just takes time to find the right place to chop yeah i yeah and i don't care yeah. if it's edited or not i mean i don't i don't care if that stuff is still in there but i know that it was two hours long so i didn't know if it would be easier to well it'd be easier for the receiver if yeah we chop that in the middle it doesn't have to be perfectly chopped just find a spot that's close to where we started talking about james and yeah yeah yeah, yeah i can i can uh dig in and see and find it cool. not a problem i would appreciate it obviously it's not like it has to be done in a timely manner <laughs> <laughs> <I'm lame. laughs> yeah. yeah i don't want you to feel that way like don't worry i won't now. stay up late at late tonight trying to get it done <laughs> it. right right no 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 <laughs> I wouldn't want to invalidate your time in other yeah. aspects of life. <laughs> you know, Shady, when you're talking about stuff, it reminded me of a thing that I had happen this morning. Uh, I do a lot of internal processing, internal, like, talk. And I was going about my <clears throat> morning routine of getting ready and everything. And I had this internal talk just going on in my head, like, and it was about a family member and I was having all these very negative feelings and negative thoughts and, you know, feeling angry and hurt and just, it just kept building and building. And then I sat at the, on the edge of the bed and all of a sudden it just occurred to me that I was listening to the wrong voice and I just said, I don't want to listen to this anymore. And it stopped. <laughs> mine doesn't stop. Sherry it's said, mine doesn't stop. <laughs> um... Anyway, I, I, and I'm not trying to compare that to, to your, what you deal with, which is, you know, probably something totally different, but, um, you know, it was, it was a strong voice and it just kept getting meaner and nastier. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm a Christian. I don't have to listen to this. <laughs> I know this is all a bunch of baloney and isn't how I'm supposed to think. Uh, anyway. I think even if the situations are different, we still get the same result from the same person. Yeah. And um, I remember I would, you know, get in the shower because uh, uh, heightening one of your senses can kind of get your mind off of it. So they talk about like, you know, lighting a flame or going outside and putting your toes in the grass or taking a shower, you know, things like that. So mm -hmm. I always like to jump in the shower, but, um, I remember having to like yell in the shower and to, to get myself to the point to just let it go. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, for the most part, I can catch it and just say, Jesus loves me. Yeah. 
And it's that simple. I used to have to, you know, get into the notes and look for all the scriptures that helped validate my feelings that Jesus loved me. <laughs> and, and now I don't have to search as hard. I can, I can say Jesus loves me and that will get me to a plane of I'm okay to, I'm absolutely not okay. It can keep me at that. I'm okay while I, you know, find a scripture that I like, or, you know, turn on Ellen White and just listen to, you know, something in the background or whatever, mm-hmm. but it gets us all to the same point. The same yeah. person gets us out of the same, you know, different situations, but gets us to the same point in feeling that it's going to be okay or they can take whatever this is yeah. and get rid of it. I actually used to pray. I would just like, you know, pray as if I was like writing a letter, mm-hmm. you know, like, like I wasn't actually talking to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I've gotten to the point where I sound like a crazy person. Cause I can just lay in bed and have a conversation with him. Well. And at first I was like, okay, <laughs> you're going crazy. Like you have finally, reach the point of crazy (laughs) (laughs) but it gets it distracts you enough that you can get a grip and realize like you were saying like this isn't i don't have to put up with this yeah yeah it's it's um it's a recognition of that that train of thought at least you know that's that's what happened to me it was um, I, these are not valid feelings. These are not good feelings. They're not how I should feel in this situation. This is selfish, sinful thinking. And I don't have to think this way, right? I think often we feel like our feelings are valid, right? Like our feelings are, um, they're supposed to be expressed. And, and even if they're bad feelings, well, that's okay. Cause that's how I feel. Um, but I, I don't think that way anymore. I, I realize that there is a sinful nature in me that I don't want to be there. Right. And yeah. yes, it does take over sometimes <laughs> and it, and it, it kind of rules the nature sometimes, but, uh, but God can come in. Holy spirit can come in and, and remind me that I don't have to think those things. And, um, I can, you know, tell it to be quiet. <laughs> I think that's super important that I don't have to, because, mm once you figure that out, it doesn't quite have the same power over you anymore. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that I spend so much time, um, continuing those thoughts and validating those negative thoughts where they just continue to stack and continue to stack and continue to stack. And there's no stopping and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And it's nice knowing that I don't have to feel that way. I can stop this cycle right now. And I don't have to live. I don't have to go throughout my day knowing that tonight when I get home, I'm not going to be distracted by work anymore. And I'm going to spiral. I know that I can, I know that he can stop that because all I have to do is recognize that I don't have to feel that way. Yeah. There's an answer to not feeling that way. So I don't want to waste my time not using that, that answer or that resource. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm just going to say, I'm going to off because I got to go hook the snow plow. We're supposed to get eight inches of snow tonight. Oh so, my, that sounds like off. fun. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, you guys, you guys uh, keep going and have fun. I'll talk to you guys later. Love you guys. Yeah. Bye. See you, Bobby. Yeah. No, it's just nice having that answer now because before it was like, I have to go stand outside and now I have to come in and take a shower and then I have to distract myself this way. And maybe I'll talk to my counselor tomorrow. I have a resource that was right there that I wasn't using. And now I have that. 
you know, it sometimes mm-hmm. it's not immediate. Sometimes it is, but it's nice just knowing that I don't have to deal with that. I don't have to go outside and put my feet in the grass anymore. I don't have to light a candle. I don't have to do any of this stuff. All I have to do is just tell him, I know that you love me and I'm just going to give this over to you because I'm, I don't want to deal with this all day and you don't want me to deal with this all day. (laughs) Yeah. His love has great power, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Especially when we look and see, you know, how he could be so actually and truly mistreated by people and actually and truly, you know, spit on and, and reviled and, and called all these names and all these horrible things. And he loved them still in a way that was deeper and greater than I can even wrap my mind around sometimes. Um, and so me and my feeble little humanness, when I start to have these negative thoughts about others or even myself, um, I can look at that love, look at in the face and say, yeah, that trumps, uh, you know, a thousand times over what silly little negativity I'm having uh, at this moment <laughs> so there's there's power in that and um i think he likes to likes to give us that that power it's the compelling power of love sister white uses that term a few times the compelling power of love i, I like those words because it says that love isn't just this thing with no, you know, true effect. It really, really can compel, it can move, it can change things. It's pretty amazing. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you guys for the conversation tonight. It was, uh, it was a good one. Uh, It's good to talk about these things. 